Welcome to Artist to Art. I'm Aaron Jack and we're going to be live with Jason from Rubine Red Gallery in Palm Springs, California. So we're just going to all get on here and Artist to Art. I think this is my 54th interview. So welcome back. We're going to have Jason on here. Requested on. Perfect. Thank you, Tanya. Welcome back. We're just going to send that little message thing out and invite all of our friends now and later. Hey! <laughs> we made it! <laughs> the old guy found the request button. Oh, no, no. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's always like a changing scenario here with with these new technologies. <laughs> how, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. Nice. So what what... Why don't you tell us a little bit, like, where are you? What is Rubine Red Gallery? Yeah. How did you end up there? We're, we're in sunny Palm Springs. Uh, it's going to be 105 today, I think. Uh, and uh, Rubine Red, you, on our little chat a few minutes ago before we started, you asked me how to say it and... and what it is. So um, I spent the first 25 years of my career in the printing, the commercial printing industry. So working with marketers, ad agencies, artists, publishers, um, everything from postcards to coffee table art books. And uh, Rubine Red is a pigment that uh, is used by ink makers to make red and pink ink. And it's bait, rubine, ruby, ruby red. That's kind of where the, the name comes from. So it's kind of a nod to um, artists who mix their own paint um, printers. And I, and I also thought that the Jason Howard Gallery sounded really boring. So uh, I wanted a different name other than my own uh, to put on the gallery. So we opened in February of 2019. So we've been here about a year and a half, and uh, and here we are. <laughs> wow, what a strange, like, half the time you've been open now, basically, has been under very strange circumstances. Yeah, yeah, the last eight months for sure. So how's that been, like, switching, um, maybe, like, what what were you doing before this, and... How have things changed in this time? Uh, things have changed a lot and then not a lot. I mean, it's kind of, things haven't changed as drastically uh, as I thought they would. Uh, I think part of it has to do with the unique place that Palm Springs is. Uh, out of the, th there are, so Palm Springs sits in the Coachella Valley. So Coachella movie or music festival that a lot of people have heard of. Um, we're two hours from LA uh, through a pass, two hours from San Diego over the mountains. So we're inland about two hours. Uh, when the pandemic hit and the shutdown started, the um, businesses here were completely shuttered for two months um, from March 16th and through the end of May. And then we, we're able to reopen to have people in the gallery starting in late May. Uh, we didn't have many people, but at the same time, uh, starting around June 1st, on, our online traffic just went way up. Um, sales went way up. And uh, I don't know if, if psychologically people around the end of May started to decide that this was a long-term thing and if they were going to buy art or look at art that it was going to be online or I don't exactly know why that happened but it's a common thread from the other gallery owners that I've talked to um, and so we started opening by appointment only and then in mid-June we opened the doors regularly Palm Springs has a very high elderly population. Elderly, oh my God, I should say over 50. Uh, but so the, the health officials here in the city and the county have really taken it a lot more seriously than a lot of other parts of the country have. 
And so um, it's mask on, indoors, outdoors, everything. Uh, if you're if you're out and about, out of your home in the city, you're you're wearing a mask, so, and people are actually pretty conscientious about it. So we um, we did a few video things at the start of at the start of uh, the shutdown, but uh, it really also psychologically for me, I just took a few weeks and did nothing. Um, it was a chance for me to kind of reset after a busy first year. Um, and I took some time off in August, went back to Minnesota, which is where I moved here from, uh, did a bunch of artist uh, studio tours and visits, uh, brought a bunch of art back uh, for the new season here, which runs roughly middle of September through the end of May. Uh, because it's so hot here in June, July, and August, uh, there really is a low season here. However, this year, people have been pent up in their houses and wanted to get out. So actually, June, July, and August was really busy in Palm Springs in terms of rentals and hotels and people coming in. A anywhere people could drive from, they would come. So Vegas, LA, Orange County, San Diego. San Francisco is about a seven hour drive. So we get people driving and renting for the weekend and, and weeks or months um, just to get out of the house um, somewhere different, right? So, so yeah, this summer was a little, was a little odd, but when it's, you know, 115 outside, which it was most of August, there's not much foot traffic during the day. <laughs> so um, a lot of businesses and galleries close uh, for the month of August. In terms of how it's impacted the greater economy here, there, um, there are like, I think there's around 45 galleries in the Coachella Valley. There are uh, probably 15 or so, 15 to 20 here in actual Palm Springs. And on the main strip, there's probably 10. Um, seven of those have closed. So um, we've lost about 30% of the galleries since February here. Um, a, some of it was pandemic related. Some of it was people close to retiring and just were like, why are we gonna, you know, this is a sign, why are we gonna live through this? Some people have temporarily closed saying they're going to reopen. Um, some have closed and are in the process of moving and opening up new spaces. So it, it, the pandemic has really jumbled things around. Um, and, and sadly, we've lost some galleries. I don't, I don't know whether that will make the rest of us more healthy. Um, it's kind of a horrible thought, but uh, remains to be seen. So right now the season is starting to pick up. Uh, it's very busy. The last two weekends have been very busy. Wow. Wow. So, so it's like it's busy just, with people buying art or just like walking around or both? Um, it depends. You know, one weekend will be a lot of uh, 20 somethings walking around, but not buying art. The next weekend, the demographic will be totally different. And it's, it's really hard to predict. Um, so we just, I mean, we're doing, we're doing what we can do. Um, I've kind of stopped doing, um, the, the video things, um, I, I wasn't getting a lot of traction from them. My family and friends loved them, <laughs> but they were, uh, they were a lot of work. And um, uh, so I just, I kind of stopped doing them. I'm super happy to be doing this with you because it's something new for me. So thank you uh, for, for inviting us to do that. We, we have hosted two shows. We also hosted a show uh, Labor Day weekend, and then we had a show two weekends ago, uh, Russ, Russ White and Syed Hossein from Minneapolis. And we're lucky because we have, we're able to control how many people come in. We have a path, they walk through the gallery, they walk out the back door of the gallery, and there's a large parking lot back there. So we had a, had a bar set up, and people, if they chose, could um, have a glass of wine or a glass of water or a soda and stand around and socialize out there. And a few people did. And so we're gonna continue doing that, um, especially the locals like uh, something to go and do because everything other than hospitality here is closed.
so still pretty much. Wow, how many people do you allow in the space at a time now? Um, six, uh, and the shows also are running from like 1 p.m. to 8 p.m., not from like six to eight or five to seven, so that people can come you know, during the day if that makes more sense. Um, what we have found is people actually are coming over the weekend. Some are coming Friday night, some are coming Saturday when we advertise it, some are coming Sunday. Uh, so people have been doing, a, especially locals, have been doing a, a, a good job of actually spacing themselves out. So we really haven't had to limit uh, or, you know, uh, have a limit person at the door standing, standing guard, so to speak. But, wow. How, um, how has that worked? Like, do you think that's is going to shake it up for what you do in the future? Um, assuming that this all goes away in the next year or two. Yeah, let's say it goes away in the next year and enough people are vaccinated and, and mm -hmm. uh, or people are comfortable. Um, you know, the atmosphere of standing around and having a beverage and a snack and talking with the artist and the vibe of an opening is something that um, a lot of people are addicted to. <laughs> <laughs> addicted to is the wrong word to use, but I mean, it's, it's fun. It's a social event. And so it definitely has put a damper on the socialness of it. Um, and, and I know I am anxious to go out and do that again. Uh, so, and anxious to have that vibe in our gallery again. So we'll see. I mean, uh, we're going to keep doing the socially distance openings until we don't have to do them anymore. Uh, it actually isn't a lot of work. Uh, we bought some red ropes for the front of the gallery to make it look a little more inviting or uh, safe. And um, when we have been advertising the in the openings, we've been very upfront about you have to wear a mask, you have to, you know, this is the hours, this is how things are going to work when you get here. So, so far it's been pretty easy to adapt, but then again, like I said, our space has a very we can flow in the front door and out the back door. And so that's a luxury that not a, a lot of galleries have too, so. Wow, yeah, so you've talked, you've been talking to a lot of galleries, right? And like seeing what they've been doing, like what's been working, what hasn't been working and implementing. Um, yeah, yeah, gallery owners here in the city, um, especially. Yeah, you know, and again, it's been, because the summer is such a slow time here in Palm Springs, um, a lot of the galleries go down to two days a week, just Saturday, Sunday, or Friday night, Saturday. Um, because of the heat and because of the low season here, um, it was kind of weird. It's almost like we've had five months of slow instead of just two. But except, except you said that it's been boom, like it had but it's, been boom. Yeah, it's been busy. So, I mean, um, restaurants... Yeah, it's, it's weird. It's a weird mix of people coming into town and wanting to do things and, and locals staying home. Um, there are really two economies here. There's, there's the locals that live here year round in the valley and then there's um, the visitors. And I suppose there's maybe a third one is that there's the renters, the longer term renters. So. And, and the longer term renters like that come in seasonally. Well, uh, so a couple things, like uh, uh, there are a lot of Canadians that have homes here. So in a quote unquote normal year, they would start coming down October 1st. Um, their visas allow them to stay for six months before having to return to Canada. So a lot of Canadians come down October 1st, they stay for three months, they go home for Christmas, uh, they come back after New Year's and they stay uh, into early April. And that's their, their six months. Canadians aren't allowed to come right now. So there's been a surge in rental properties here, uh, open rental properties. At the same time, people who are sequestered at home in Portland and Seattle, and especially the San Francisco Valley uh, Bay Area, uh, who, are, who have been paying six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month for a, a two bedroom condo can rent a house here for $5,000 a month, you know, four bedroom house with a pool. So there's been a gigantic influx of long-term renters here 
um, especially from uh, the tech areas here in California. So, and, wow. and, a lot of, and a lot of people just buying homes here and just saying, forget the city. If we have to work for, from home, we're going to buy a home here. So the housing market here is uh, pretty crazy right wow. now. So it's weird. It's a fa Palm Springs is a weird city compared to a lot of the country. So the things that are going on here that I'm describing probably aren't going on, you know, in, in St. Paul or Lincoln, Nebraska or wherever. Right. I, I heard that some of those things are going on in Vermont right now. Um, actually, I just read a New York Times article about that. So I'm just yeah. kind of like intrigued by like what's happening in different places in the world during this time. And as it relates to art, like what are, what are tech, are you seeing, because you're seeing a lot of influx in like tech, the tech market and tech people buying homes. What have you found like that re that's relatable and art wise, or is it like across the board? Is there something that you find like more relatable for tech people? Well, um, you know, surprisingly, um, so, so Palm Springs has a long history of, of having kind of come into its own architecturally here with mid-century modern architecture in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, the history of, of Palm Springs is kind of interesting because it, um, I don't know if you want me to go into that, but yeah, feel free. <laughs> um, I'm just kind of interested in what's going on yeah. there. Right? So there's there's a there's an urban legend uh, about how Palm Springs really got started. So Palm Springs right now is 70% GLBT, um, so gay, lesbian, bi, trans. 70, 70% of the locals who live here permanently, residents, are gay, lesbian, bi, trans. Wow. Um, and it, it's the highest in the US, the city high in the US. And, and the history behind, and so arts is a big, what comes with that, I suppose, if you wanna apply broad stereotypes, which we sh probably shouldn't, but the arts are big here. Um, and it's, it's uh, also a vacation or city. And so the arts are big here because of that, right? Museums, shopping, um, and a lot of people visit here because of the architecture. The architecture, Art and architecture, tourism is a, is a big thing here. So what happened, allegedly, um, uh, and if I'm wrong, somebody correct me, uh, but in the 20s and 30s and 40s, there was, a, there was a gossip columnist in LA called Hedda, I'm gonna forget her name. It's not Hedda Lettuce, that was a drag queen in New York. Um, I forget her name. Anyway, the, the, the drag, the, the gossip rags that covered the movie industry in LA, um, there was some scandal. Uh, one of the sons of one of the publishers was gay and was lived here in Palm Springs. And uh, the studio execs at the time had a conversation with this woman about uh, outing her son. And she said, well, fine, then I'm gonna out all of your actors who have houses in Palm Springs, who have their mistresses and their pool boys and their whatever here in Palm Springs. And they came to uh, an agreement um, that what happened in Palm Springs would stay in Palm Springs. So there was a, you know, before Vegas adopted that mantra, uh, there was a, an agreement between the press and the, stu and the studios that n no one would report anything that really went on here in Palm Springs. And that was a, an industry secret. And when that industry secret became more and more widely known, more and more stars bought places here. Also in their contracts, in the, especially in the 40s and 50s, the stars had to remain within a two hour drive of the studios in case they needed to be called back for a reshoot or a screening or something like that. And Palm Springs was right at the outer edge of that two hour drive. So what happened is all these stars started coming here and having second homes here. And uh, it really became a haven for Hollywood, a, a, a getaway before Malibu, before uh, the beach. And so uh, with all of that money flowing in here, mid-century modern architecture, which was just gaining ground, uh, started to become popular and the architects like Kreisel and, and Fe, Frey um, started to build homes here. Uh, 
for themselves and for all the movie stars. So, and, and what's happened over time is the city council uh, has been, not uncontroversially, has been pretty smart in limiting development here. So there's a lot of mom and pop businesses here. There's no fast food here. There's no Target. There's no Walmart. There's no, um, there is, there are those retailers in the Valley, but they're not in Palm Springs proper. So uh, the art and the architecture and the small town feel really has been maintained here in a way that it hasn't in some of other, other tourist, tourist towns. So with all that art and architecture that was happening in the 50s, there were prominent artists that vacationed here, Jackson Pollock, Calder, the list goes on. So uh, abstract art became very popular and in fashion here, abstract expressionism ex especially. And so still to this day, abstract art is very sought after and appreciated and collected here in the, in the Valley. So most, uh, most of the galleries have some of that art in it. A lot of the galleries specialize in it. Um, and when I started thinking about the next chapter in my life, uh, a few years ago, having become an art collector, been, having sat on the board of the Sioux Visual Arts Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is a nonprofit gallery there, a, a long running, uh, fantastic nonprofit gallery there. Um, Sue is spelled S O O. I'm putting the plug in for them. Oh yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I was just on the phone. I was just I just did an interview with Sandra, who is in Minneapolis. So an yeah. artist, an interview who's in Minneapolis. Yeah, and um, so I, you know, I bought my first piece of art I ever collected there at that gallery. I, I volunteered. I was on the board. I was the chair of the board. Um, and over the last 15 years, and so when I wanted to open a gallery, it was do I do it in Minneapolis or do I do it in some other place. And having vacationed here a lot uh, in Palm Springs, I thought, well, you know what, I'm, I'm going to try it there. And Minneapolis galleries are a destination, especially because of the weather in the wintertime. You have to get in your car and go and drive to a gallery. And there, although there's um, things like the Northrop King building there, which has Art of World and, and different things like that, um, long-term for-profit galleries really are destinations. And I felt that um, although I adore the art scene in, in Minneapolis-St. Paul, um, I also personally just wanted a change of uh, venue. So I, I picked Palm Springs, lots of galleries here, lots of traffic. Um, and, and so uh, as I set up the gallery, I wanted to have some abstract art because of its importance, because of the history in uh, in Palm Springs, but I didn't want to be an abstract only gallery. I also wanted to show art that wasn't normally seen here and bring the Midwestern art that I had grown to love and appreciate and collect here to Palm Springs so that the gallery was really unique. Um, so I don't only show Midwestern art, but probably 80% of the artists and art that I have in the gallery are from is Midwestern, focused a lot on, on Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, so that was a really long answer. <laughs> and I know, I know my partner is watching right now, rolling his eyes because he always tells me I talk too much. No, 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 no. That's, that's perfect for, uh, for this. This is, this is what it's about. Like this, uh, IGTV to just have a conversation, <laughs> you know, their discussions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's how I ended up here. Um, moved here, uh, started working remote with my corporate job moved here, um, planning to open a gallery, and uh, it, it happened. We moved here in July of 18. By February of 19, I was open. Uh, it, happened, it happened way faster than I thought it would. Um, I can remember going home in December of 18 and meeting with uh, Terrence Payne and Joe Sinis and Jennifer Davis and Carolyn Payne, who's the director of the Sioux. Um, and a lot of people, I met with a lot of artists saying, can I please represent you? I'm opening in two months and I don't have any artists. And, and they all said yes. And I was shocked and humbled and thrilled and proud. And so we, we, we started. Um, one of the reasons that we were able to do that is I found a space that had been a gallery on the main drag that had been empty for years. And so it was kind of needed to be clean, but it was moving in. So... Wow. 
So I'm, I'm probably lucky that I didn't know what I didn't know. <laughs> Isn't that I've always the case? Before, <laughs> having only been involved in nonprofit galleries, which is a totally different curation process than a for-profit gallery. Um, um, but we'll see, we're here. Yeah, what, what are some of these differences with a for-profit and nonprofit? Because I, I know there's a lot of artists out there who follow me who are very curious and like, you know, how they should interact with galleries, which galleries they should interact with, how should they interact with them, yeah. um, how to connect. Um, like the, the, well, there's kind of two questions there. So remember the yeah. second, how to interact with a gallery. Um, the, the difference between nonprofit and for profit. So, well, nonprofit and for profit, right? The decisions that I make, um, especially starting a for profit gallery, um, are different than the decisions that I saw and that I see being made at nonprofit galleries. There's no, there's no bad or right or wrong. They're just different. Um, being on the board of the Sioux really taught me a lot. I would encourage artists to uh, to find it on art anybody, any art collector, but artists in particular, to find uh, a nonprofit gallery where they live and volunteer and be on the board. Um, you learn a lot. You just learn a lot. I learned so much. Um, for instance, the Sioux um, in their budgeting. Uh, we learned over time not to budget for art sales. We just budgeted art sales at zero because we didn't know, and it was hard to predict which shows were going to sell, which shows were going to sell, which artists were going to show and half their work they didn't want to sell um, because it was personal to them. A lot of times the, the, the Sue's mission was, uh, underrepresented and underserved and emerging. And so a lot of times the show the, the shows that we were doing was a, was a person's first art show. So they would show some very personal things that they didn't want to sell. And if we planned on selling some of it and then didn't, we would have a hole in the budget. So that's one thing that's very different. When, I, when I'm looking at bringing on an artist, I'm trying to predict what's going to sell. And that it still is very hard to predict. Um, and, and I'm wrong all the time. <laughs> um, uh, and which is humbling and again, a learning experience. Um, I've, I've, I've had some art in the gallery that I thought would sell and didn't. I've had art that I questioned in my mind, am I doing the right thing? And it, it's popular. And so um, that's one thing that's very different. The other thing is, um, at least at the Sioux, we didn't curate so we didn't curate for sales. We, and in fact, the board and the volunteers didn't curate and the executive director didn't curate. We had an, uh, an artist panel. So we had four local artists. That panel rotated one person off, one person on every year. I'm pretty sure they still, I'm not on the board anymore, but I'm pretty sure they still do it that way. Um, I know I saw Joe Sinis, one of the Minneapolis artists, I saw him join here on the, on the feed. So. He, oh, might, he, he might know if they still do it that way, but, and he's one of the artists we carry here. Oh, awesome. Um, um, and so, uh, and Russ White as well. I saw his name scroll by. But um, so that art, so there would be a call once a year, and then that artist panel would decide who would sh what shows would show. So artists were deciding which artists would show. That removed the politics from it. It removed the budget discussions from it, it just removed a lot of uh, mess from the decision process and the board could focus on fundraising and running, you know, the, the, the gallery. Um, now that's a, that's a different model than a lot of nonprofit galleries. And so uh, I'm not saying that's the, the best way to do it, but, but it, it definitely taught me um, as a as a business person who is used to looking at bottom lines, when I started on the board, I'm like, you know, why did we, why did we have the show? We didn't sell anything, and it would drive me nuts. I can remember one show at the Sioux. Uh, th there was an artist, and he made these helium blimps with little gondolas, and the gondolas were full of houseflies, and there were like six of them in the gallery, and and there were sensors on the gondola 
And if the flies all moved to one side of the gondola, the little blimp, the fans would turn on and the blimp would move across the room. I thought that was absolutely insane to even show something like that. It was the highest, one of the highest attended shows we've ever had because the, the word got out that it was so weird and so cool and who thinks of this and who does this? And you'd walk around and the flies, which were drawn to motion, would, the blimps would follow you around the room. It was, it was fantastic. Um, you, you know, but, uh, so I, I just learned so much. Um, having been in a for-profit business, then all of a sudden submerged in this nonprofit gallery environment to kind of um, check myself or rethink those things. Um, I would love to, here in my own gallery, uh, do, do eventually do some curating for curating's sake and have some wild outlandish things. Um, I have to focus on paying the rent right now and you know, having only been in business 18 months. So uh, um, hopefully in the long term we can become successful and, and do that. Um, your second question was uh, interacting with galleries. Yeah. Uh, and what you've learned from them. What I've learned. So oh, oh, oh. What, first, first, there were two parts to that. Okay. Artists who want to interact with galleries and then what you've learned from galleries that you've talked to. So they're kind of like, if okay. you learn things from galleries that could be related to artists. Yeah. As well. um, the first thing for artists is be prepared. Um, one thing that I was not prepared for was that I would get two or three artists a day contacting me, either walking in the front door with something under their arm, which gallerists hate. <laughs> gallerists normally don't like that. Um, and online and, you know, whether through Instagram or Facebook or email or phone call or whatever, I still have two or three artists a day call me and want to show here. Um, I am flattered and I think it's fantastic. Uh, and, but m nine out of 10 of them aren't prepared. When I say, I had one this morning, I had a sculptor come by and he's like, I have something, you know, to show you. And, and, and I said, okay, so where's the rest of your stuff? He's like, well, it's at my house. And I said, so where can I go online to look at all of your stuff? Well, I don't have a website. Okay, do you have an Instagram? No. Okay, so how am I gonna, unless I make a trip to your house and time is precious for everybody, how am I going to quickly ascertain whether you have something that's of interest to the gallery? Um, it's not a value judgment on how good or bad the art is. It's just about being prepared. Um, so, and much like graphic designers, graphic designers who do freelance work, often their own, their websites are the worst because they're busy and the last thing they want to do at the end of the day is do more web work on their own site, right? And, and so um, our artists can be the same. I mean, at the end of the day of painting or drawing or creating to switch gears and try and go and, oh, I'm gonna spend a couple hours updating my website. You know, that's kind of the last thing you wanna do. And so it doesn't get done. But if you're serious about being a professional artist and selling your art, you have to keep your, your webs, you have to have a, a good, easily navigatable website, not one built in WordPress in 2002. Um, I'm sounding a little preachy, but I run no, across, no, no, no. I run across it. I, I run across it so often. And I run across artists whose art I like, and then I go on their website, and the last thing they updated was, 2000, was 2014. So I can't see any of their new work. And I don't know what's sold and what's not sold. A lot of artists have all their art up on their website and I can't tell what's available and what's not available. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a store or a shopping cart on your website, but at least have a way to mark things as sold or unavailable or for sale. Um, and, and it's not just me, it's, it's um, I get that, I, you know, when I started my website, I got that feedback too from people saying, say I went on, I tried to look up this artist, it took me six clicks to get to your 
store where I could see a price. So I've had to work hard at, at making my website as up to date as possible and um, as easily to find and navigate. So, so that's the, that's the first thing is, is, uh, you know, Instagram is fine, but it's not a website. It's not a store. It's not a place to review a portfolio. It's a place to have a quick look. But um, if you have, and, and I have to say, I have an iPhone 10. I'm lucky enough to have a, a modern, really modern iPhone with a great camera. I do all the photography from my gallery with my own camera. I don't hire a photographer. Um, is it the best photography ever? Obviously, it's not going to be. But pretty much everybody has a decent camera in their cell phone now. So um, it, it shouldn't it doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money to keep that website update dated if the artist has a, a decent phone. Um, so anyway, that's the first thing is keep up to date and have something. If you're going to visit a gallerist in person, I would call or email ahead and, and say, Hey, I would love to stop by. When's a good time? Uh, because I've had artists stop by when I'm talking to clients and then I don't get to see them. So it's a disappointment for them. Um, uh, and I don't want to waste their time either. Uh, like I said, I, I have, um, uh, Palm Springs is big for abstract, but my gallery isn't. I have a couple abstract artists that I, that I like, um, uh, one from Minneapolis and one, one from here that I carry, but I'm not curating for abstract. And so if I have an artist call and say, I'm an abstract artist, I want to warn them that they might be wasting their time if they drive to Palm Springs from LA to see me. Um, um, and again, another reason why, if I can look on their website while I'm on the phone with them and get a quick, you know, wow, is this different? Do I maybe, do I want to see it? Then um, that interaction is, is quick and efficient for both them, them and us. Um, I've, I've, I've also learned that there's a, there are a lot of um, uh, amateur artists who want to be in a gal gallery. Well, you know what? Every artist wants to be in a gallery. Of course, every artist wants to be in a gallery. Um, and I wish I was wealthy enough to have a gigantic gallery and I could show everybody that wanted to show, but I, but I can't. And so, um, and every gallery owner is the same way. We all say the same thing. You know, we all say, we wish we had more space, more room, uh, more money to just show more people and have more shows and have a staff and to be able to do all these creative things. So, um, uh, but um, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you wish you had more time and space to show more artists, yeah. but there's only limited amount. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious about this curation process because you talk about this for profit, like, how you might choose and what you've seen, like uh, how other galleries might choose artists and what's useful for artists from that knowledge. Um, well, I'm, so I, I, as we talked before, I, I came from the world of commercial print. Um, I have an uh, international, an international economics degree. I don't have an art history degree. I kind of wish I would uh, have, done more of that when I was in school years ago. Um, uh, I, I curate, I curate right now based on the vibe of Palm Springs. I'm curating mostly happy art. I love dark, I love dark art. I have a lot of dark art. I have a lot of dark humored art in my home, um, in my personal collection. I don't necessarily hang and sell dark art here in the gallery, but it's because of where we're located. Um, and, uh, you know, 80% of the traffic through the gallery are people here on vacation. And um, they're here to enjoy the Palm Springs vibe. And so I want to have Palm Springs vibe art here. Now that doesn't necessarily mean all pop art. I have some pop art here, uh, Greg Gossel, uh, Terrence Payne, um, you can kind of see behind. Oh yeah, feel free to walk us around the gallery as you yeah. talk about some of this. Um, um, 
So yes. show us show us around and tell us like why. Okay. And... Yeah. So I'm well. First of all, uh, you and I on our little pre-check, pre-video check here talked about um, the echo in the gallery. So when I go out into the gallery with the cement floors and the high ceilings, there's going to be an echo. So I'm doing this in the go for in, it. in the back hallway. <laughs> Right now, but go go out in the go out in the main room, and we'll okay. come back after cool. we look through. We cool. can so we can hear um, you with echo. It's just it's better without. It's just better without. without. Yeah. So yeah. here's a here's a, a very large piece from Minnesota Wisconsin artist Greg Gossel. Um, he starts with uh, he starts with comic books and old National Enquirers and newspapers, and then goes over the top that of that with paint, spray paint, hand painting, stencil, silk screen. Um, this giant purple prince was is still here, but from a show that we had in January uh, called Face the Music, and he did eight dead musicians. Um, so you're gonna see you're gonna see a mix of uh, you're gonna see some pop art, uh, and then just I don't know things I think are fantastic that I think people will like. Uh, this is Terrence Payne. It's color pastel. Um, the title of that piece, I should move this up, this little thing out of the way so you can see it. The title of that piece is I'll Always Be Behind You As Long As You're a Winner. So Terrence has a lovely, vibrant palette and a dark sense of humor. And I love that irony. Um, this is Eric Incala, a Minnesota native who now lives in New York City. Um, most of his work is portrait work based on graffiti. And that's called Eggman. It's round. Round art is also hard to sell, although I find it um, pretty interesting. Uh, it, it can be, people relate to squares and rectangles better. So it's just kind of interesting. Really? Yeah. Um, the next artist here is called Pansy Ass Ceramics. They are a gay couple based in Toronto and they make they just make fantastic, one-of-a-kind, uh, super limited edition things. Um, a little more on the adult side, um, but it's it's cheeky and it's fun. Um, this is actually there's a market there for it. It's there's a market there for it. Obviously, that's a this is a robe hook. It goes on the wall like this. Oh. Um, but <laughs> Sorry if the penis is offending anybody, but no, I mean, is. I, this is an open, you know, what you're showing. <laughs> this is your gallery, you know. Yeah, um, we have Samantha French, uh, again, Minnesota native, uh, oil painter, uh, lived in New York City for a long time. Now she's uh, in upstate New York, very popular on the East Coast. She painted this painting, and that's actually her in the bottom of it after she was here in Palm Springs on vacation. Um, this large painting, which is going to be kind of hard to see, is from a Minnesota artist. His name is Jim Burpee, James Burpee. He was an art pro professor at Minneapolis College of Art and Design. He was also an art professor at the University of Minnesota. He's retired now and paints mostly landscapes, but this is his older work from the 70s and 80s. And here's another one. And I just really, really love his older work. It's it's amazing. It's, it's balanced. It's vibrant. It's colorful. Um, and his work has been very popular here uh, since we opened. Um, we have two really interesting uh, estates that we handle. Um, the first estate is this one. It's Reginald Pollock. Um, and I'll go in on his name. No relation to Jackson Pollock, but he lived the last... Uh, several years of his life here in Palm Springs. And he painted, it's all um, oil on masonite, which is kind of an interesting, masonite's something that most artists don't paint on anymore, but it was popular in the 60s and 70s. It was cheap, it was sup the, it's super stable. I mean, it, you know, it's a man-made surface. And he painted all these creatures and he called them poglins, uh, pollux goblins. And if you can see, there are little faces. Um, they look like angels. Like there you can see a face, but the face is made out of the creatures. So the faces make creatures, creatures make faces. And it's all pretty fantastic. Um, he's been really popular. His widow is still alive. She lives here in Palm Springs. She's become a good friend and we handle um, the estate. 
uh, for, for her. And the other one is something new uh, that no one really knows about yet. So uh, you, ha you have an exclusive. I haven't really announced this yet. To, oh, to, we've got to, an exclusive right to here. The, to the world, first one. Right? Um, yeah. Um, and there's someone who just commented that's some, some deep, dreamy stuff in yeah. talking, about, talking yeah. about the Pollock. I, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm from an sure amazing that... illustrator that uh, Nader uh, is an amazing yeah. illustrator. And I, I, there were some. Uh, there were some drugs involved, so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I've confirmed that, but um, it's legal here in California. So, um, so the next estate that, that we handle, that we're just starting to uh, handle right now is Malcolm Myers. Malcolm Myers is a uh, very prominent Minnesota artist. He is considered one of the masters, American masters of intaglio printing, so printmaking. Um, this piece right here is called Red Indigo. Uh, he, he did a lot of his work around jazz. That piece is from 1949. Um, this one is it's called Duck's Cafe, and that's from 1950. And this one uh, is called Mandarin. That's from 1951. So he graduated from art school uh, in Wichita, Kansas in right after World War II, moved to New York City to be a New York City artist and uh, hated the New York City art scene. So he went back to teach in Wichita and then shortly thereafter got a teaching job at the University of Minnesota. And at the time he went there, there was no art department. There was only an art history department. And so he became chair of that department. And then in the early 50s, split that department in two and so basically created the art department at the University of Minnesota. Uh, he had two Guggenheim fellowships. One was with a printmaking studio called Atelier 17, my French, I'm gonna be slaughtering that, in Paris. So that was 1951, so that's when he made this piece. And then another Guggenheim in 1954, where he went to Mexico City, where he interacted with um, Diego Rivera and uh, Tamayo and a bunch of other prominent Mexican artists. So he then came back to Minnesota and spent the rest of his career until he uh, passed away in 2002 in Minnesota doing printmaking. And you can see from the prints, they're very mid-century. I mean, well, they are mid-century. They're not just, they don't just look mid-century. Um, but uh, we just got back from Minnesota. Um, that's an interesting one that he he did after he met Miles Davis. Uh, it's called Miles Mood. And uh, so we, we uh, I just went on a trip back to Minnesota. I spent, um, spent uh, four days cataloging the entire estate. And so um, we're, we're, hoping, uh, we're hoping that it's well received here because of the mid-century vibe that's here. So that's kind of cool. So, so if you follow us or or signed up for our email list, um, you'll, see, you'll see things about that coming along. Wow, um, so, so just for everybody who's not following one of us, go up to this upper left-hand corner and you can follow whoever you're not following. <laughs> or afterwards, go into the comments. And exactly. Find whoever you're not following, follow the other one. <laughs> exactly, and you know, I, I talk a lot, but I, I do wanna say thank you both to you and to everybody who's uh, to everybody who's listening today. I really appreciate it. I'm glad y'all are interested in art and, and about my little gallery. So, um, yeah. you know- Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I yeah. really appreciate you joining on here and to, yeah, I mean, just like sharing what your knowledge and your gallery and- Yeah. And, and, and thank you to everybody in the conversation for being active and typing and asking, you know, different things and <laughs> yeah i appreciate that and waving cool. whatever or just like hanging out <laughs> whatever you're doing yeah I appreciate I, i'm just noticing the time um oh yeah how are I we think we, i think we have i think we started a little bit late because of the first thing so we have probably about 10 minutes okay so let me let me show you around the gallery um, yeah perfect. a little bit more you know one thing that i that i also realized is is that was that's really important as a as a middle-aged white guy who owns a gallery <laughs> one of the things that the sioux visual art my time at volunteering with the sioux taught me is just to appreciate um underrepresented artists i mean that was their mission but but women 
people of color, different genders, and, and how really the art community is stacked against, uh, I mean, it's not just the art community, you know, our world is stacked against um, people who are different in, in so many ways. And it, and it really taught me to be conscious of that. I'm conscious of that when I see people walk through the door and through the gallery, I notice who they are. Are they men? Are they women? Are they people of color? How do they interact with the art? Do they see themselves here? Um, do they see things that, that will resonate with them here? What are the, what are the, what are the, what is the mix of artists that I have in the gallery? Um, uh, and I have to admit that that's hard. Um, it's hard. Uh, just being very honest, it's, it's hard. I could have 100% people of color art in this gallery and it wouldn't, it, I don't know that it wouldn't resonate in Palm Springs, but it might not. And if my intention is to stay in business, I, that art has to sell. It's, it's a quandary and it's hard to talk about and it's scary for me to talk about it because, but, but those are the things that you think about as a gallery owner in a for-profit gallery in a city that's very white and this city is very white. Um, and, and um, but I just want my audience also to know that I, I am always thinking about that and, and trying to do my best on the spectrum of all of that. So um, that's a whole another podcast that you could do and talk about just that issue, yeah, I'm I, sure. I appreciate um, you sharing because that's, that is really difficult to talk about and, you know, like understanding like what's going on in the world, but also like what it takes to be in business and that, you know, carrying a flag, you know, carrying one flag or another flag at the end of the day, you're a business, you're not a nonprofit you have to pay the rent right right um and yeah amen so let's let's <laughs> yeah we can go way deeper on that but let's oh yeah looking around sure. the gallery so the show we have right up up right now is syed hossein syed is a pakistani american and he does collage and painting so as you look at um there's all sorts of hidden figures. Um, this is this is a little hard for me because I'm on the bottom of the screen, but my camera's on the top of the. Um, uh, so it's 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 just fascinating. There's all sorts of stuff hidden in there. Lots of social commentary. Uh, this is Russ White. Um, Russ does paint, and then over the top of that paint, he does colored pencil, photorealism, colored pencil. Um, he also does, uh, there's another Syed Hossein. So, you know, coming out here, it looks very abstract. But if you, if you zoom in, you know, there's people and there's topics and there's, there's things to see. Um, uh, this is more Russ White. That's colored pencil on paper. Uh, more Russ White. That's just cut, cut paper collage. Um, we have some little more poppy art. This is Eddie Meunier. He's from France. He does these silicone um, encrusted uh, creatures. It's all silicone sculpture, so it's, it's soft. Um, he's been a, a big hit in Art Basel and in some different art fairs. Uh, we just started carrying Paul Russo, who's an East Coast artist. He does uh, all of his work on PVC. So that's plastic. It's giant, obviously, compared to a regular Crayola box. Um, we have somebody from your neck of the woods who you probably know, Atticus Adams, Pittsburgh. Really? Mm, uh, so Atticus does, uh, he works in, <laughs> he works in mesh and metal sculpture and creates these fantastic fantastic things. Um, I do want to highlight two other artists. Um, the first one is uh, Chloe Rizzo. She is an art professor in St. Paul, Minnesota. Chloe um, does this veil series. So it's all based, they're sculptures, um, they're porcelain. They're all based on a female figure, female head. And her work is about the veils that humans and especially women wear. And so she, 
there's just these amazing sculptures. Um, some of them are a little creepy, some of them aren't. Some of them are a little more sensuous, uh, but she's, she's fantastic. And then another art professor from Minnesota, Betsy Alwyn. And Betsy creates her sculptures out of porcelain lace. So she creates lace out of porcelain wow. and then fires it. Um, this is the largest piece we have. It's a, a female bust, but she, uh, I talked before about how I like irony and art, little tongue in cheek. Um, you know, she takes porcelain lace and makes a gun. Now I'm not that crazy about having a gun in the gallery, but I love the irony of this. This, I mean, I suppose you could throw it at somebody and hurt them, but you know, this, this gun couldn't hurt anybody. In fact, if you tried to, it would break. And I love the irony in that and the unexpected nature of the sculpture. Hmm. Um, yeah, and we, and we have, we have some, some pop art. Um, Julian Prohlman. We could talk a half an hour about the discussions that this piece has, has uh, spawned in the gallery, Elvis and Cassius Clay. We have um, Jose Navarro, who is from Barcelona. He does these fantastic digitally altered images. Um, they're made on high gloss uh, acrylic. Um, we have the pillows, the glass pillows made by Colin Roberts. So these are actually full-size pillows made out of plexi. Wow. Um, and they're, they're even more fantastic in the light when the light shines on them. Um, Sculpture, you know, I've learned sculpture is hard to sell also. I mean, a lot of people like sculpture, but they think they don't have a place for it or, you know, I need to have a stand for it or I've got pets and kids and I don't want it knocked over. So sculpture can be a hard sell as well. Wow. Do you sell pedestals for the sculptures as well? Um, I have. I, I have. I just had um, the cabinet maker that did my kitchen cabinets here in my house. I had him make those pedestals. And so... I've had people ask me to make pedestals for them. Yeah. Cool. Cool. That, that's, something, that's something to know is if you're a sculpture maker out there. Yeah. You know, if you, even a little pedestal, even, um, even like these Chloe Rizzo, Rizzo sculptures, even a little pedestal that's, you know, two inches tall and just a little wider, to have that option available, um, it's amazing how people will, can love art, a piece of art, but they can't visualize it in their own home. Wow. So, you know, they may like a big painting like the one behind me, but they want me to actually bring it to their home and hang it in a couple different spots to see if they really like it. Um, and, it's, and it's the same reason why people hire interior designers, right? They can't, some people just don't, can't envision what the room will look like if it's blue or, you know, and so it, it could be the same way with art. Um, it's also fun going into people's homes. And, and Interesting. So you so you go around to people's homes and like hang it up in different places and see like yeah. what works. Yep. That's so cool. I've, 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 had, so, mm -hmm. I've had people ask me to come hang their art. I mean, art hanging is a whole profession. Um, so I've I've done some of that, and and it's really nice because it also results in a in a personal relationship with that client, and then they come into the gallery and they tend to buy them. Nice. That's really cool that you've built all of these relationships in the last year or so being yeah, there. And, and you know, it's, it's like any career. It's like any, the longer you do it, the better you're at it. You learn tricks, you learn things, you develop a network. Um, uh, yeah, you develop a network, right? Uh, so the longer, the longer you can stay in business, the bigger that, that network becomes and the easier it's it, right. It, 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 so the bigger, the more you're in that one thing, the more, the bigger that network around it grows and you're able yeah. to. I mean, it, it's just like, it. it's just like Instagram. Um, you know, we started off with zero people and in 18 months, I've got almost 3000. And nice. I haven't bought a list. I haven't recruited bots. You know, I mean, for $11, you can get 5,000, you know, people to follow you or whatever. But if there are 5,000 people that follow you that don't give a shit about art, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Do anything to help me. Um, I suppose 
it might help in a algorithm, you know, some thing. But um, but what I think about is every time I post, three thousand people potentially see that. And so what if I had if it gets out to three thousand, if it actually gets out to three thousand people. Right. But what if I had fifty thousand? And right. You know, then it's mm -hmm. potentially fifty thousand people would see it. And so if um, so it, it's the same with your in-person network than it is with Instagram or Facebook. Yeah, letting people know and the email list. And um, I'm not sure how much longer. Instagram has been letting me go a little bit longer than the hour, if that's cool. Um, so I'm curious if there's any other ideas for artists and, like, would would you suggest, like, talking to a gallery and seeing, like, would, would you ever suggest an artist go talk to another gallery like down the street that you know would oh, like their art? Absolutely, I do that all the time. In fact, a lot, I talked a little bit earlier about, you know, I have abstract artists come in and work with not really an abstract gallery. Now, I, I say that as, um, I say that as behind me is a pretty abstract piece of work, <laughs> but, but we're, we don't specialize in abstract art. And there are galleries here in Palm Springs that specialize in abstract art. And I, um, absolutely, I send, I send them down the road. I mean, Say go tell them that they can, you know, because I, you know, I want, I want all the artists to be successful too, um, and I want the other galleries to be successful. The more successful galleries we have here in the city, the more of a draw it is. The more people will come here for it. That's why it's so sad that we lost them, um, you know, in the last six months. But I think you may be covering the microphone. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. Is that better? No, it's cool. It's yeah, yeah, it's better. I just wasn't sure if that was the thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've had a lot, a lot of artists say that, you know, galleries just ignore them. I mean, I, I respond to every single person. I, I mean, who, who genuinely wants to show here? Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I should, that's my responsibility to do that. And so, and I've had a lot of artists say that, that they don't get that response, that they don't get a response. Well, you know what, if you don't get a response, probably not the best fit for you then. Um, and, and don't be discouraged by that. Um, it's the same, it, it's basically a job interview, right? I mean, how many job interviews do you have, does a person have to go to through, until they find the, the perfect job or the perfect employer? It's the same with artists and galleries. So, um, uh, and, and by the way, there's artists that the gallerists contact that say, sorry, we can't, you're not a fit. And, and we don't have time. Um, uh, we have a portrait show, a group show coming up in, in November here, November 14th, it opens. And I contacted a lot of artists and they were just like, I, I don't have time. You're not a fit, whatever. And, and I, uh, and that's okay. <laughs> I was disappointed. I had some, some people that I, you know, that I went after and they finally were like, stop pestering me. I'm not going to, I can't be in the group show, <laughs> you know, um, but, but you don't know if you don't ask, you know, so. You really don't know. You, it's, 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 it's an interesting and strange thing because I just curated, I've curated two shows since COVID started and it's interesting like seeing it from both angles there. Like what's, <laughs> I just curated a show with uh, 15 photographers and I was blown away by the ones who said yes and I was also like it took me going through a bunch to find like the right ones so I'm sure you you find like yourself going through how do you look for artists to show in your gallery where are you looking well since I knew I wanted to do this at some point in my life I had kept a list <laughs> I had kept a list you know back to my comment earlier for those of us of you still with us, but um, uh, I, I, I kept a list of all the websites of all the artists that I liked. And um, I, I, went, I went through that list and I started calling people um, when I started the gallery. Um, Instagram, I do a lot. I, I've, I've found quite a few people on Instagram. Um, uh, and when I find them on Instagram, then I go to their website and I look more. Um, Jose Navarro from Barcelona, that's how I know him. Um, it was purely his Instagram feed, ran across it, thought it was amazing, 
reached out to him. Um, I get a lot of people recommending artists when they come in. Oh, have you heard of this person? And I, you know, and I spend time and, and look them up. Cool. So it's like, so there's like that recommendation. There's the looking at Instagram. It's the people that you've known in the past and kind of like yep. back and forth figuring out like who and how do you choose the pieces like based on like what's gonna what you think is gonna sell what they have available like what's it's, that it's it's both of those things um it's both of those things um a, a lot of it is what does the artist have in inventory right now um and and what are the price points and what you know, what do I think will go, what, what, what do I think will f fit in with the vibe that I've got going on here? Um, and, and what sort of price points, if I may ask, like, yeah, do you so, sell things? Yeah, market? so um, we have $200 works of art and we have $20,000 works of art. Wow. Um, um, those, that's the range. Most artwork that we sell is... Fifteen hundred to four thousand um, dollars. Now the art market here in Palm Springs is a little different. Three cities down in Palm Desert, there's Heather James. There's a bunch of big name galleries there, and you know some of the galleries down there, their prices. Um, uh, well, Heather he Heather James. I just looked at her website this morning. She has her website, and then then she has her under one hundred thousand dollars section. <laughs> so it's a very different, you know, it's a very different art market twenty miles away from here. Wow! In, in this in the same valley. So, um, uh, but you know, art even in my own collection. I mean, I have very few pieces over five thousand dollars. I just, first of all, I haven't been able to afford that in my life, and. And second, it doesn't need to be that expensive to be great, to be fan freaking tastic, you know? So um, I also want it to be approachable. I would rather sell many, many more pieces at lower prices. To me, that's more fun. Right. So, right. so, you're, so you've kind of put the majority of your work in 1,500 to 4,000 and then a couple things on yep. different sides. A couple things higher and lower. Yep. That's very cool. So do you have any suggestions for artists pricing their work? Maybe like emerging artists or who are just like figuring out their pricing structure? Um, or they've been yeah, like Yeah. Um I I've I've seen emerging artists have their first show and they throw a twenty thousand dollar price tag up on the largest piece in the show. And and it you would make me cringe because it could be amazing, but it's only worth $20,000 if somebody's gonna pay $20,000 for it. And that's not just with art, that's with a used car, that's with a boat, that's with a house, that's with you know, a, an antique, anything, right? It's only really worth what somebody will pay for it. And so um, once you get above five or $10,000, the people in that market, the collectors in the market for that art are paying attention to things like, will it, is it really worth that? What have pieces sold before? Are there auction records for this artist? It, it, it's a different kind of purchase. It's a different kind of scrutiny rather than I just like that, I want to see that on my wall. Um, so I also have artists that, that price themselves too low. Um, And I run into a, a little bit here because things are a little more expensive here than California than they are in the Midwest. And since I have so many Midwestern artists, I do have a lot of people come in and say, oh, your art is really affordable here. And then it makes me wonder, should I raise my prices? Should I? But people are savvy and there's the internet. So if I'm, if I, I can't have, an artist can't have, sell something from Minnesota for $2,000 and I have it on my website here for 3,000. It doesn't, it doesn't fly, it doesn't work. Well, first of all, it's dishonest and I'm not gonna do that, but it, people will look up the artist and they'll see, and then they'll get mad, either mad at the artist or mad at the gallery or mad at both of us. And so pricing has to be consistent, but a lot of artists do underprice themselves, 
especially a lot of Midwestern artists. Um, Darcy Book is an artist from Houston who I carry. And uh, I'm sorry, Austin. And the art market in Austin um, is low. The prices are low. Um, and it's something that her and I have talked about. It's just the market there, people don't, people spend a lot of money on art, but they buy a lot of art that's not very expensive instead of, you know, they might buy 10 things at $1,000 instead of one $10,000 sculpture. Um, so every city is a little different, but um, so it's hard, but, but be open be open to talking about your gallers about it. I don't start the conversation there. I usually, I usually, after talking to an artist about being represented here, then I say, what are your prices? And if I'm shocked that they're too low or I'm shocked that they're too high, then I have a discussion with them about it. But if they're an artist that's been around for a while, they know what their work sells for. So it, it usually, most of the time it's, It, right. It, 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 it works out the way I think it should, you know, most of the time. Interesting. I'm not surprised. So interesting. And, and, and how do you work it out if they like sell a piece that you're showing on their website or someone finds them through you? I know there's certain things like these people are finding people in different ways. Yeah. Um, so first, first of all, first of all, that's all spelled out in the contract. And mm -hmm. if a gallery, if a gallery wants to represent you without a contract, don't. <laughs> don't let them represent you without a contract. It protects the gallery, it protects me, and it protects the artist. And, the, and, the, and a contract should be written to be fair to both. And so that's spelled out in the contract. The, the, the consignment percentage is spelled out. What do you do if artwork is damaged? That's spelled out. Um, somebody just commented and said, ooh, I see prints. Yeah. Yeah, feel free to. There's, there's, there's prints back there. Um, there he is. All of this artwork is available, so feel yeah. free to reach out. And, <laughs> go on the website. Uh, go on um, the website. <laughs> um, Wait, what's the website again? Uh, what's your website? RubineRedGallery.com. R-U-B-I-N-E-R-E-D. Yep. Rubine. Perfect. Um, go there or like add up here. Yeah. I'll recall it. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, so I, I just had one this week where an interior designer worked with an artist to sell a, a large piece that I have and I need to ship that out, you know, and did I sell it here at the gallery? No, but I've, um, I've had the expense of housing it and promoting it. So, um, in our contract, it's, it spells out that when that happens, what, how the gallery is compensated, you know, should the gallery get 50% in that instance? Probably not. <laughs> you know, Probably not. I mean, I mean, that's not how I work, but um, right. it is something that you should negotiate and agree on beforehand. So there's right, no question. Because these things will come up. Yep, because they will come up. Yep. Mm -hmm. What are some of the more, do you have some interesting scenarios that artists should watch out for in the contract and be aware of and make sure like to find that like compensation on either side to be like oh i should be aware of this and that uh, i know we're going a little over our that's okay over an hour, but, um but i'm just curious if there's anything that the artist should be like oh like this is a fair amount or like this is a little bit unfair that you know or this is more than fair on the gallery side like that they should just be like oh okay Right. I mean, I, I would make sure that there's an insurance clause in the contract. You know, if, if this gallery were, I mean, if we were to have, we sit on the San Andreas Fault here in Palm Springs, right? So if there were, <laughs> if there were a major earthquake and the gallery was destroyed and all the art was destroyed in it, how, how does that work? What, what do you get compensated? Um, so I have that spelled out in, our, in, in my contracts. Um, I have it spelled out for a damage to a single piece. What if somebody comes in and picks up, <laughs> picks up a sculpture and drops it and it shatters. What, you know, what happens? What if I break something? I mean, I've done that before. I've dropped a painting and put a hole in it. And it's like, oh my God. So how does that get compensated? Um, so I, yeah, just make sure the work is insured and that it's in the contract that it's insured. 
um, you know, uh, it, if, if you're represented by a gallery and the gallery sells a piece of work once in a while for you, you're probably, there's a certain percentage that the gallery gets. If the gallery is selling two paintings a week for you, then you have some, you as an artist have some leverage and you should be able to say, you know what, I'm such a sure thing for you that I want my percentage higher. And, and the gallery should be like, okay, that's fine because it's, it is a sure thing for the gallery. And like I said, I as a gallery should rather sell, sell more art than less, right? I mean, that's why I'm doing this. So, um, but you have to have that leverage, right? I mean, you, you, you can't be an emerging artist and say, well, I want 70%. The gallery is gonna say, go to another gallery. Um, the, the average is 50 across the United States. So if you're an emerging artist, you, you can't, if you're an artist late in their career, who has sold for 30 years and is selling a lot and consistently, consistent, then you have the leverage, right? Then, then you have the, the business history to support getting a larger percentage. Wow, interesting. So it's all about that, like, leverage, like in that agreed upon number percentage. Yeah, for the price yeah and you know, le leverage is a word that sounds very lawyerly and, and a little maybe shady. But um, you, you want it, you want it both people to feel fair, right? You want you want the artist and the gallery both to be happy and feel like the business arrangement is fair and and positive. So so you know whatever those terms are, that's that's the goal. That's the goal. I see Ramon Maiden joined from Spain. Oh, from Spain. Nice. Uh, Ramon is going to. Uh, I just got three of his pieces in the in the post uh, two days ago, and his it's going to be part of the uh, the portrait show that I talked about a little earlier. So. Wow, can you show that work or right now or no? Um, it's actually packed away in the back, but there's, there's an example you asked me earlier, how do I find my artist? Uh, I found him on the internet in 2013. In 2014, I commissioned him um, to do a piece for me, a small piece for my home. And I've remembered him ever since. So when you know the gallery opened, he was on my list. To, to try to have here. So um, yeah, Ramon, uh, what Ramon does is he takes vintage, um, mostly vintage images, vintage art, whether it be magazine art or poster art, um, uh, things like out of Life Magazine or Esquire that are vintage and he draws over the top of them um, tattoos, on celebrities and, and um, images. So he adds, you know, that, that piece of art, that, that vintage piece of poster art that's already there, he adds his own layer on top. And so it's, yeah, it can be creepy, it can be fun, it can be sacrilegious. I'm a little nervous right now describing his art knowing that he's watching me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Because I don't want well, I think that's the, that's such an interesting thing is that you have your way to describe art and you have a way to describe it to the public that the artist might not have or might have like a yeah way. you know it's like I don't want to make it mad or say something wrong or you know because I just I, I'm so thrilled to have the artist that I have and you know you're so this is kind of funny. <laughs> I, I mean, that's like kind of the beautiful thing is that you're you're relating what it's about to the people that it's so it's such a weird thing, I think, as an artist. How, how do you like an artist to describe their work to you? Like, is that like a thing? Like, because you're using very certain like term, certain like terminology and certain ways of describing um, do you like it when an artist is like, here's what my work is about and they yes. describe it, or do you just want to see it? Yes, and, and on my website, I have each artist that I represent has their own page. And uh, I usually take the verbiage, uh, well, I ask them for an artist statement. 
And a lot of times they have a website with that artist statement on there. And I try to learn and memorize and know how they describe their own work. Uh, and uh, I try to remember that so I can describe it accurately. You know, I, <laughs> so, um, yeah, once, once again, and if somebody's really into the artwork, then they're going to want to read that artist statement on, on, a, on an artist's website. And an artist statement can be three sentences, and it can be two paragraphs, and it can be a 10-page essay. I've seen all of it. Um, the 10-page essay is a little too much, usually. <laughs> but, um, you know, and two sentences is usually too little. So, okay. Somewhere. So what do you like to see? What do you like to see for an artist statement from art, an artist that comes to you? Um, something short and concise and, and clear. I, I mean, um, you know, two or three paragraphs a page that should be enough to for somebody to get their idea across if it's more than that a lot of people just won't read it or won't read it all uh, all of it won't read all of it um so i do some editing too but i you know if i edit an artist statement for the for what's going to appear on my website i always show them what i've done because i'm i don't want to put words in their mouth um and I don't want to take out something that was critical either. So I don't know. It's just. This is all like really good information. I really appreciate you sharing all this with us. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I'm going to, it's 1.30. So I bet. Yes. I've talked I to should your, probably go. <laughs> I've talked your ear off for an hour and a half. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you for talking my ear up and everybody else. But we've, <laughs> we've had a consistent audience who's been like fully engaged. So I really oh. appreciate uh, you sharing and I just want to say thank you Jason uh, with the Rubine Art Gallery yeah. uh, I'm Aaron Jack you can find me at Aaron Jack Line Art thank you to all of the viewers watching yes thank uh, you yes uh, I think this is episode or the, my 54th episode in Artist to Art 54th interview solo interview because I've done other episodes um, is there anything else you'd like to say before you go? Any words of inspiration? And uh, no, you? just I, just keep creating. And um, yeah, just, I, I mean, if you're an artist, keep creating and, and keep trying to inspire other people and keep reaching out to galleries. And, um, and for the galleries out there, you know, do the same, keep, keep being inspired and, and keep finding new folks. Um, and, and thanks, thanks everybody for your attention and thanks for uh, uh, listen, listening to me ramble on. And, <laughs> and if you're in Palm Springs, stop by the gallery. And if you're not, visit us on the website or on Instagram and, uh, and let me know what you think about, about the artists we show. Cool, thank you All so right. much. All right, All right. talk soon. to you soon. Bye. All right, bye.